Alright, we'll turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8, verses 21 through 24. I'll read a passage first, but before I read that passage, let me open us up in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening and for the start of this study about this ancient creed. And as we just heard, that the creeds and the confessions, the councils of your church are not the same authority as your word. And so help us as we look at this to make that our heart, that we would have thoughts of you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that would be accurate to your word. Truths that have stood the test of time and have shaped the church, may it shape us now as we embark on this study and may your Son be glorified uh, in all that we hear and all that we think about. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 8, verses 21 through 24, we read this. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin." Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself, since he said, Where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's one of the passages that people will speak about in terms of what all do we have to believe to be Christian? What is essential to the Christian faith? What's important? And clearly from those words... That is of first importance, is knowing who Jesus actually is. It was the Enlightenment historian Edward Gibbon, who in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, famously criticized the church for dividing the West over one little iota. And we have that expression in popular language today from that idea. And that one little iota he's talking about is the controversy that sparked uh, and made uh, necessary this council that we're going to be studying. And they didn't have the idea that this was just one little iota. Uh, they had something more of the attitude that's reflected in that statement of Jesus. So they thought it was worth fighting for. And you could debate the language, and they did, but... They thought it was a matter of life and death. What I want to do today is I'm calling this first one. I did the same thing with the canons of Dort as I did sort of a historical backdrop in session one. I'm going to do the first same thing this time. And I'm calling this From Nicaea to Constantinople. And the reason I'm doing that is because uh, you'll notice it's sometimes referred to as the uh, Niceno-Constantopolitan, I can't pronounce it when I say it fast, but from Constantinople Creed, because in 325 Nicaea and in 381 Constantinople, you had, we'll see why there was an addition to the creed, but it makes up what we call the whole Nicene Creed. So what I'm going to do is break this into five sections. We'll go through it fast, but to make it easy, they're all going to start with C. So five C. Constantine, contest, council, creed, and here's a funny word for you, Cappadocians. That's going to refer to three particular theologians who we'll just mention in passing. So that's where we're going. Constantine, contest, council, creed, and the Cappadocians. Um, I had to do it because otherwise there wouldn't be alliteration, and you need that. Uh, just to keep it simple. But let's start at Constantine. Let's start at the historical backdrop leading up to Nicaea. Um, as you know, Christianity was illegal 
up until this time. The church was persecuted, sometimes badly, by Nero, by Domitian, and finally by Diocletian, and they were just coming out of that one at the turn of the 4th century. And at this time, the Roman Empire had quickly seen its realm divided into two and then to four. Constantine was military leader in Rome's western territory, where his father, Constantinius, first reigned, and he was very popular. He wasn't himself a Christian, but by this point, most of the soldiers in the army were Christian. He was very popular with them because he tolerated all these different religions. And he ruled over the western part of the empire, that quarter of the empire at that point. Um, and he sent his son Constantine east into the courts of Diocletian to be educated. But for Diocletian, this had a different purpose. He was essentially held hostage to make sure that his father wouldn't step out of line. So he was there in the courts. He was educated by them. And in 306, Constantine escaped to join his father back on the Western Front, the campaign that started to take more and more and more territory in Britannia and then down into Gaul. And the goal was to eventually go to what Julius Caesar did, to cross the Rubicon and to eventually take over the Western part of the empire. But Constantinius died and Constantine took over. And he was declared emperor of the West in York in that year of 306. But he had to march into Italy to defeat the competing emperor Maxentius. And by now it's 312. And it all leads to the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. And Maxentius had brought his troops out into the open. Uh, they vastly outnumbered Constantine's troops. But then... So the legend goes, Constantine saw in the sky the sign of the cross and supposedly uh, heard the voice, in this sign, conquer. Now later on, Eusebius relays that actually it was earlier in the day, and then another part, uh, another person relayed that it was actually several years before or a year before in a different battle, but that's kind of irrelevant. That's the idea, that he sees this sign, that uh, in Christ's sign, he would conquer. And we can't really know how genuine Constantine's conversion really is, but right away he does make changes. When he um, defeats this, uh, these forces, he's in control of the West. And immediately at 312, he declares this Edict of Toleration. It would eventually be known as the Edict of Milan. And crucifixion was stamped out. The branding of criminals was outlawed, and the reason in the law was that they were made in the image of God. So there was some immediate effect from Christian morality. Uh, there was unprecedented protections put into place right away in 316. The rights of women, children, peasants, and slaves were all instituted, again, because they were made in the image of God. Uh, one example of that is that it was now illegal to leave babies out to die. Uh, before that, it was not illegal. We sometimes forget how barbaric the pagan world was and how the world outside of Christian influence is. In 321, various activities were forbidden on the Lord's Day. As we'll see, now that indicates, of course, that Constantine did not invent Sunday worship. Uh, we'll see a little bit of that later. But necessary field labor and the, flea, uh, and the, uh, the freeing of slaves are, were exceptions to that, sort of a works of uh, mercy and necessity thing uh, for Constantine. Uh, bishops were permitted to make civil court decisions. So overnight, Christianity went from illegal, not to the official religion. There was toleration of all religions. And eventually he takes control of the eastern territory of the empire, as well from one Licinius, who... At first, he went along with the Edict of Toleration, partly by Constantine marrying his sister, who also happened to be named Constantinia or something like that. He was not um, kind of like George Foreman with all his sons and daughters, George, 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 again. It's the same thing with Constantine's three sons. They were all named Constance, Constantius, and Constantine II. So it gives you an idea of the uh, originality there. But he moves, uh, in 324, he moves the capital of the empire to the east, to Byzantium, 
and he renames it Constantinople. It, it was to be the new Rome. And so now he's in control of everything. There's one united empire again. Now, for Christians looking back on this, and really even at the time, it wasn't just like, now we finally figured out, you know, maybe there was a trade-off there. No, in Constantine's own day, there were, there were concerns about this idea. According to critics, what's sometimes called Constantinianism was a disaster for biblical Christianity. Uh, that's the criticism. And there's two basic flavors that that takes. The first criticism has to do with what became known as Christendom. The emperor was immediately appealed to for theological judgments. Now, what does that mean to them? It means that he's creating the church, he's creating doctrine, and that's certainly not biblical. And the empire went overnight, again, from being persecutor of the church to now persecutor for what it deemed to be the true church. So now the emperor gets to decide who's in and who's out. That's a criticism. And we have seen that um, down to the present day. We have seen that confusion. Uh, so keep that under your hat because there's both sides. Uh, sometimes people can blame the wrong thing. The second criticism has to do with the age-old problem of syncretism. And syncretism, of course, is the, the blending of religions. Israel couldn't get enough of this, and that doesn't stop there. Um, Christendom does the same thing. Constantine's own religion was syncretistic. Um, he worshipped the sun god, uh, Sol Invictus, the inconquerable sun. And in fact, in the coins, right away, there's images of... Uh, well, I don't know if there was images of Christ. I don't think there was a live issue anyway, in the same way it would be for the Puritans. But there was a Christian inscription on one side, but then there would be the uh, inscription of the sun deity on the other side, the same coins. And, of course, um, when he had originally won that battle in 312, the Roman Senate put up a statue that I believe is still near the Colosseum that dedicates his victory to the sun deity. And so he didn't strike that out right away. He was ambivalent to these questions. Um, in fact, even when he was dedicating the new capital, in the political forums, the statues of the sun god and even the mother goddess of the east were dedicated, along with Christian inscriptions and statues and so forth. But you could reply that that's just a secular court, and he didn't do that in the church. So there's arguments on all sides. But I think the main thing to get out of this is that Constantine was ambivalent. He wanted peace. When he was reigning in the West, he already had to put up with the Donatist controversy. Maybe will explain what that means a little bit later. But the church was already divided. He comes out East, and he's expecting this much purer form of Christianity where they're closer to Jerusalem. He gets out there, and there's a fight. And it's that fight that's going to lead to what we're talking about. But what did he want here? Above all, he wanted peace. He wanted to consolidate power. But about this solar monotheism, which is what the sun deity was. There's two sides to this story. Clement of Alexandria, for example, a century before, 100 years before, he uses this imagery of Christ riding his chariot like the sun. Imagery similar to Psalm 19, 1 through 4, except he injects Christ into that. Um, at the same time, Tertullian, and literally same time, about 200, 100 years before Constantine, Tertullian mentions how Christians were mistakenly thought to worship the sun since they met on Sundays and prayed toward the east. You'll see that a lot. Evidence that Sunday was the day before Constantine. But there you see it in Tertullian. Well, let's look at that second C, contest. A debate had emerged between Arius. Arius was a priest in Alexandria. He wasn't a press, he wasn't, sorry, he wasn't a bishop. He didn't have that much power. He was a priest. And the bishop of that city, Alexander, conveniently named Alexander in Alexandria, he was the bishop, he stood against Arius. And the teaching of the Arians was simply this, that Christ was not eternally divine. He was before the world, but he wasn't eternal like God. They had a famous saying, there was when he was not, namely the Son. That there was, even if it was outside of our time, there was some sequence, some moment, some point where the sun had to be created. In other words, and, and here's the, the first big words we'll use, the Greek words, Jesus was similar in substance, is what they were saying, 
The word that was eventually used in the creed was homoousius, same substance. The Arians were saying he was homoousius, similar in substance. Nothing more similar. Highest of all created things, but created. The Arians could speak of Christ as divine in the moral sense of being perfectly good, superior to anything in the material world the highest of all spiritual creatures in heaven, but still underneath God. Now, error never arises in a vacuum. There's always a reason for it. There's always motives. In fact, somebody has once said that the mother of heresy is always the exaggerated defense of some neglected truth. A heresy always emerges because of an exaggerated defense of some neglected truth. In other words, the pendulum is swinging, is what's really happening there. And, and that was part of what was going on here. So how did the doctrine of Christ get to this point by the beginning of the fourth century? Well, the emphasis on the oneness of the divine essence, especially in the philosophically minded city of Alexandria. They were not just Greek speaking, they were Greek philosophically. They were the philosophical Mecca, if there was one, in the Christian world. And so much of what their theologizing did was to make the gospel and make the biblical worldview credible to the Greeks. And that's what they did with the nature of God. God had to be one. God had to be impassable. God had to be uh, infinite. He had to be immutable. He had to be atemporal, eternal. Now, we agree with all those things, but so where does that lead them to this view? Well, there's more to it. There's a crucial factor leading the Arians to see that when the Orthodox are saying that the Son and the Father are homoousia, same essence, same nature, the Latins had a word for it too, consubstantial, one with him in substantia or essence. When they hear that, they have no categories because you're saying there's two things that are one thing, and how does that work? Well, Arius, and by the way, it's interesting to know that Eusebius, now there's two Eusebius is running around at this time, and Eusebius of Nicomedia, he's a hardcore area, and he's really the leader of their group. Eusebius that you're maybe thinking of, the church historian, many believe that he was, well, we know he was sympathetic to the Arian cause because he served in Constantine's court. He's best buds with Constantine, and he wants peace too. And so if you read that part of the church history, he'll speak about this battle the same way that Constantine would, that there's this force dividing our peaceful gathering and so forth and so on. He just wants peace. But he, he accepts the creed, and he uh, is not as known you know, poorly to history as, as the other Eusebius is. But Arius and Eusebius look at this, this indivisibility of God to imply that the Father could not possibly have produced the Son out of or with his essence. So you could, sort of, you could track with them. You guys, you believe that the Son is in some way, and I know we haven't got to this, we'll have to wait to this, eternal generation, which is not something that's specifically addressed in the creed. Not explicitly, but that whole light from light, it does suggest it. But they look at this and they say, well, the Father could not have generated the Son out of or with his essence, so Christ must have been fully created. Plus, they're just dealing with the incarnation. He's joined with his human nature. And right there, that's impossible for the one God. By the way, there's also a Gnostic assumption here. Gnosticism, the, the shorthand version is spirit good, matter bad. Okay, And so the one true God couldn't possibly have gotten his hands dirty with the created order. So... He had to have an intermediary to even create the world, let alone be incarnate. The world as we know it is evil. And so the created logos, the word, became their highest of all the intermediaries that create. Now they have proof texts. They don't, but they think they do. Um, Colossians 1.15 is a tip, and we'll look at these in detail as we go. So I'll just skim them right now. Colossians 1.15, typical proof text because it says of Christ, he's the firstborn of all creation. Look, firstborn of all creation. There it is. 
Now, in the Septuagint version of Proverbs 8.22, it says, He created me as a beginning for his works. Now, you know, in Proverbs 8, wisdom is personified. And all the fathers universally agree that wisdom is being used there preeminently of the Son. So everybody agreed to that. But they looked at that created. Okay? And so that Logos was created that helped God create. They looked at texts that use language of subordination of Christ to the Father. 1 Corinthians 11.2 and 15.28. Those two verses in Corinthians that talk about the Son in some way submitting to the Father. And we'll look at these. Or that the Father is greater, John 14.28. Mark 10.28 was a favorite. And this is in all three synoptic Gospels. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. This is Jesus speaking to the rich young ruler. And the people that get that reading don't catch the subtlety of what Jesus is doing there or the context of what the rich young ruler's problem was. So we'll answer that. But there were Orthodox writers like Hillary and then later in the next century, Augustine, who took all these texts that Arians would use and just answer them, knock them down one by one, and show them how, no, it's not talking about Jesus ontologically inferior to the Father. It's either talking about his human nature or eternal generation, and they divide those texts up. Okay, third C, the council, going slow. Um, there was originally a council or a synod of sorts in Alexandria in 320 and then again in Antioch, but those didn't really carry in a weight, any weight, and they wanted there to be a universal statement on this. Constantine did. Again, he wanted peace. And, uh, you know, another common criticism of this is that Constantine handed this down or Constantine forced this or all that different. This is complete nonsense. Uh, this would be an, an ecumenical council of over 300 pastors. He had just consolidated power in the East the year before. He doesn't want to start a fight and a division over theology. So this is to put the lid on something that was already a fight. And it is believed that there was another guy, uh, Hosius of Cordoba, if anybody wants to know, who presided over this council, and it wasn't Constantine. Uh, this guy was a moderator. At any rate, a uh, few inescapable implications of Arian teaching. If Arian teaching is true, and this is really what the council was seeing, if it's true, then number one, the Trinity is not fully eternal, right? Because then the, the Son isn't eternal. So that's one implication. Secondly, the Trinity is not immutable, because if the Son comes to be, then he's not immutable. And, and they would, of course, say in some way that's true. They would have no problem with that. Thirdly, a creature, Christ, would be worshipped. How many texts in the New Testament is Christ worshipped? The Arians would be calling divine and joining in with worship of a creature. Fourth, if that was true, a creature, Christ, would be looked to for salvation. In what sense could he save us? Fifthly, the Son does not actually have any of the divine attributes ascribed to him in Scripture. They, they couldn't mean the same thing as they do for God. And then sixth, this really amounts to either polytheism or else the divine status of the Son is wholly analogical. And by the way, the Arians were fine with that. They said it is by grace that he's son. So there's a, almost a little bit of adoptionism in there, even though they didn't want to claim that heresy in particular. So the Arian teaching was clearly ruled to be a heresy. And it was that word homoousios that made the difference plain. There was a lot of Arians that would have said, well, let's just sign it with our fingers crossed behind our back. But that word was a, was a big deal for them. Many of them still signed, but Arius didn't. And he was exiled. And there's other decisions of the council that I think are interesting, uh, some that dispel some myths, uh, but we'll probably run out of time, just real quickly. Easter, the date of Easter, there was a debate between East and West where this settled that, uh, made that official. Um, there's stuff about the canon that's really worth answering, but we could save that for Q&A time or just for another time. Let's look at that fourth C, and that's creed, what came out of that. I'll say least about this because that's what our study is going to be on. But there's three basic sections to the creed when you come out of Nicaea. By the time it's all wrapped up, there's really four, because then the Holy Spirit gets his own section, and then you have a lot of those things afterwards. And the whole thing, if you notice, is really flowing in the same way that the apostles 
uh, creed is. So it's very Trinitarian. And then it adds some of those things, some of the same things at the end. And um, three parties emerged from this. You had, you had the uh, Arians that were willing to sign. You had semi-Arians. You had radical Arians that said, no, it's heterousios. It's a completely different nature. Okay? And what they basically did, there was a couple of bishops that they had to take out. Arius was on exile, but they knew he was coming back. And he was only a priest anyway. So he, believe it or not, was kind of small potatoes compared to some of the, the bishops who were Arian. And they said, we've got to take out this bishop and this bishop, and they pretty much did easily. But there's this one guy that they could not get rid of, and that was Athanasius. And Athanasius had taken over for Alexander once he died. During the council, Athanasius was too young. He was just a deacon. But by this point, he was a bishop, and he was not willing to uh, let any ground go. And so Eusebius of Nicomedia especially launched this conspiracy to get rid of Athanasius. And then there's another thing about the, you know, dreaded Constantine thesis. You know, Constantine and his sons especially were Arians. The, the emperors after them were Arians, except for the one pagan, Julian the Apostate, and he wasn't any help either. But Athanasius was exiled like five times. They couldn't keep him in his office, even though he's very popular in Alexandria. But it's really true. The maxim that was said about him, if you've ever heard of it, uh, Athanasius contra, contra mundum, Athanasius against the world, it's because all those Arian bishops out east that had the uh, emperor's ear were against him. There was also language barriers uh, that became a problem. And some of these language barriers we'll talk about as we go, but the Greeks would use the word hypostasis, and for them that meant persons or identities. But when the Latin speaking world is looking at that, they say, well, we have a word for that, and that's substantia. But if you say there's three hypostasis, you're saying there's three essences. That's tritheism. Or at least you're trying to be cute and clever, like all you Greeks do. And that was kind of the attitude. The Greeks, in turn, looked down on them and said, well, you can't think about this. But really, it was just, they were talking past each other. And Athanasius especially understood this. And he sort of bridged the gap between them and said, look, it's really the intent of the word that matters and not the way that word translates one-to-one -one into your language. By the way, we can use this kind of thinking in Bible interpretation or every time we say, well, that word literally means this in the Greek or it literally means this in the Hebrew and, and nine times out of ten, no, it doesn't because that's not the way language works. It's the, it's the intent of the word and, and you have to get some context for that. Um, and then finally, the fifth C, the Cappadocians. And we'll run into them a lot when we get to the Holy Spirit section because as time wears on, Constantine dies in 337, his sons take over, one of them uh, dies in battle fairly quickly. The other one's murdered. You've got these two uh, relatives of Constantine. Le the, the military said, we're not serving under anybody except for one of son Constantine's sons because we don't want to go back to paganism. Problem is they misjudged that because one of his nephews, Julian the Apostate, got that name because he was Julian the Apostate. And he, uh, he, his whole goal in life was to turn everything that went Christian back to pagan. Now, fortunately, he died in battle just two years later in 363, and it's reported that he said as he got the spear in his eye, I think, it was like gruesome death, and he said, uh, you have conquered me, O pale Galilean, uh, for anybody that wants to wrestle with what color Jesus was, I guess. But you see that, I'm just kidding about that. Uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what color he was, but that's supposedly what Julian said. Um, at any rate, but I think we can all agree it's a good thing Julian died. Uh, and then after he died, then you had these other kind of weak emperors until about 379. And you had a new emperor named Theodosius. And Theodosius took things further than Constantine did. Whereas before Christianity was legalized, Theodosius made it the official religion. He, start, he saw himself as one of the old Jewish kings. He was destroying uh, pagan temples. And he was wiping them out. Now, he did make some mistakes. And one of them is he launched this assassination against uh, some political, uh, what do you call them, defectors? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Dissenters. And Ambrose of Milan barred him from communion and said that you cannot come back to the Lord's table 
until or unless you come to the steps of the church on your knees and repent. And Theodosius did. And that, of course, gave Ambrose a lot of ecclesial and political clout in the last decades of that century. But long story short, Theodosius saw one of his first duties as calling another council because there emerged another group of people who started to deny that the Holy Spirit had true of him all the things they had just described to Christ. These guys were called the Pneumata Machians, spirit fighters. They were against the Holy Spirit being called divine. And they said, you Cappadocian fathers, and there's these three guys, Basil of Caesarea, he'd be called Basil the Great, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Gregory of Nyssa. And he said, you guys are introducing this foreign deity or force into the Godhead. And so they had to get together again. Council was called at Constantinople in 381. And you see the completion, the insertion of the words about the Holy Spirit being divine. So we'll come back to them when we get to the section on the Holy Spirit. But um, I'll leave it at that for the historical backdrop. There's obviously a lot more you can say about that. That's just a whole century wrapped up in the you know 25 minutes or so. But uh, we'll break there and then we'll open it up to questions after.